And I think we're in Exodus like 9 or 10 on Sunday nights. But when Pastor went through chapter 3 and 4, the Lord spoke to me about something. And uh, I had been taking notes and studying some different things uh, before that. And then as he went through it, it uh, kind of jumped out at me. So this should be familiar to most of us. Um, but before we start, how about we have a word of prayer? Lord and Heavenly Father, I pray that you be with us this evening. Lord, I pray that we'd see something from thy word, something that we can apply to our lives. Lord, we want to hear from you. We want to be better children of thine, and we want to serve you with all of our hearts. So speak to us tonight through your word. We ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so if you can open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3. And I've titled this, What Has God Given to You? Now, God has given each and every one of us different things, different talents, different abilities. What I can do, maybe you can't do. And, but what you can do, I may not be able to do. It's like parts of the body. We can't all be the eye, can't all be the nose, we can't all be the same uh, member. But we all have a part in the body. So God has given you special talents, and God expects each of us to use those talents to glorify him, because the chief end of man is to glorify God. That's our function. And we are to allow God to use those talents that he's given us. I mean, that's why he's given them to us. He doesn't give us things to just have for us. It isn't about us. It's about him. We are to be a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. That doesn't mean that's above and beyond. No, that's, the, that's what's reasonable. So let's, let's think about this. A lot of times we go, uh, you know what, God can't use me. I can't, and then fill in the blank. I can't preach, I can't teach, I can't this, I can't that. And you also think, what can God do with someone like me? I have so little as far as open talents, things that I can do. What can God do with me? Well, let's take a look and see what God did in the life of Moses. Okay, so we know, I believe every one of us knows the story of Moses and the burning bush. Okay, so Moses is out in the wilderness He's been doing this for about 40 years because he ran away from Pharaoh in Egypt because of what he did, how he killed that Egyptian, and he had to flee. So it's been 40 years. So he's out in the backside of the desert. He's hanging out with the sheep or goats or whatever it was. I think it was sheep. I don't know that the Lord tells us a whole lot, but he was a tender of the sheep. And um, there's this little, I'm going to call it a shrub, that catches on fire, or looks like it's on fire. And that was nothing new, that wasn't a big deal. Uh, they, they had seen stuff like that in the desert all the time. It gets dry enough, it just spontaneously combusts. But this one did not consume. It's sort of like, take, it's sort of like taking a marshmallow when you roast the marshmallows and they catch on fire. Well, they go quick. Well, what if it just kept burning? That would get your attention. So Moses is out there, and he sees this bush, and he says, well, hey, there's the bush. And he's like, wait a minute, it's not being consumed. And if we look at verse 3 of chapter 3 in Exodus, Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. This is a big deal. This is something I never saw before. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. So God physically, audibly spoke to Moses, and he called him by name. He said, Moses, Moses. And Moses says, I'm here. I'm right here. And the Lord said, draw not, this is verse 5, draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. 
And then he identifies himself in verse 6, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. So he knew enough not to be staring at God and go, well, he probably thought he was going to die. That's probably what he thought, okay, because they knew no man has seen God and lived. So he was, he was very concerned about him looking at God, which was not actually God, but a, a burning bush, but God spoke out of that. So anyhow, he looked, he looked away. And the Lord said, in verse 7, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Okay, so God basically said, I have heard from the children of Israel out of Egypt, I have seen their affliction. And in verse 8, he says, I am come, this is God speaking, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And then he identifies the people that are living in that land right now. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Okay, so God goes through all that. Then verse 10, he says, come now, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So here is where God says, I'm, co I'm come down to help them, to take care of them, and I am sending you to Pharaoh. In verse 11, Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? In other words, why did you choose me? I'm a nobody. I'm a shepherd. Lord, don't you know, 40 years ago, I tried to help the Israelites, and you saw how that went. Now I've been out here for 40 years, and you want to use me? First of all, anybody that I knew that was in Pharaoh's court is gone because Pharaoh had died, and it was a new Pharaoh. They don't know me. I have no political power. I have no way to do what you're asking me to do. Okay, this is what Moses, now you've got to understand, some of this is my interpretation, okay? But basically Moses said, I'm the wrong guy for the job. And I know that feeling, okay? So, verse 12, God said, certainly I will be with thee. Now, we have that same promise from God. God says he will never leave us nor forsake us. And God has asked us to do things in his word. And what do we do? We say, I'm not the right guy. Okay, so the Lord basically says, I will be with you in verse 12. And then Moses comes back in verse 13 and says to God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And we all know the, the next verse where God said, I am that I am. And you're to tell the Israelites, I am hath sent you. And God said, now verse 15 here, he, he continues on. God said, moreover unto Moses, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Okay, so God covers the question that Moses had, and then he continues in verse six, 16, said, go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob appeared unto me, saying, I've surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. Okay, so you're going to go to the Israelites and you're going to tell them, I am hath sent you, and I'm going to be with you. Verse 17, I found, th this is something that I hadn't seen before. God is speaking here in verse 17. And I have said, that's past. So God said, I have told you this before. Now I have a cross-reference in my Bible 
where it goes back to um, Genesis chapter 15, verse 14, where God told Abram that your descendants are going to be in a land. They're going to be serving other people, and then I am going to bring you out. And that's where that point is. God said, I have said, I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of, and then he lists all the, all the peoples. Okay, so that jumped out at me when I was studying this, and I was like, that's kind of neat. God kind of put that right there. I have said this. You should know this, Moses. And he probably did. Verse 18, And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. And now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Okay, so the Lord says, they will listen to you, the children of Israel, they will hearken to you. And you're going to go in to Pharaoh, and you're going to tell him we want to go and sacrifice to God. Verse 19, and I am sure. Now I found that humorous. God says, I am sure. Well, yeah, God knows everything. Okay. I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. He's going to resist. He's going to say, nope, not in this lifetime. Verse 20, and I, this is God speaking, will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty. Okay, so the Lord gives the rundown. You're going to go to the children of Israel. They are going to uh, hearken to your voice. You guys are going to go in before Pharaoh, and you're going to say, we've got to go out and, and worship the Lord. And Pharaoh's going to say, no, I don't think so. And then God says he is going to bring the plagues and show his power over all of the uh, heathen gods, every single one of them, he's going to show his power. And then the Israelites will leave Egypt. And you guys are going to get a whole bunch of stuff from the Egyptians. They're going to give you gold, silver, clothing, everything that you need, and they're going to send you away. Okay, so right there, before Moses ever goes anywhere or does anything, God has already told him, this is the timeline, this is what's going to happen. So let's Let's see what Moses has to say. Chapter 4, verse 1. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. Now remember, God said, They shall hearken. In verse 18 of chapter 3, They will hearken. And Moses says, They're not going to listen to me. How often do we do that to God? God says, I want you to do this. He lays it on our heart. We're supposed to be a testimony, a witness. We're to be joyful. We're to have the right attitude. We're to be feasting on God's word. And on and on and on. And we don't trust God. Like, I need something else, Lord. Okay, so the Lord says to him in verse 2, what is in thine hand? What is it that you already have? And he said, a rod, a stick. You're like, okay, big deal. The Lord said, cast it on the ground. And he did. And when he did, it became a serpent. And Moses was afraid of the serpent. So I don't know if it was a... Uh, poisonous type serpent. I, I don't know. Maybe he didn't like any kind of snakes. I have no idea. But either way, he wasn't happy about the snake. And then the Lord said, grab it by the tail, which is not how you handle snakes. And when he did it, it became a rod again. <clears throat> Verse 5, that they may believe that the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. 
And the Lord said furthermore unto him. Okay, so the Lord's like, okay, so you got that one that you can show them, a sign. Here's another one. Take your hand, put it in your bosom, and pull it out. And he did, and it was white with leprosy. I am sure that that was uh, kind of scary and frightening. And at that point in time, the Lord said, do it again. And he put his leper's hand back in, pulled it out, and it was just like the rest of his skin. So there were two signs that he could show to the children of Israel. Verse 8. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, near, nor hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land. And the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. So God gave three signs for Moses to use. So then Moses went and did what God said, right? No. No. Verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. I get that. I don't like the public speaking. This is terrifying being up here. Okay? But the Lord had called him. And the Lord told him, this is what you're to do. So he had an excuse. Slow speech and slow tongue. Verse 11. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Well, we know the answer to that. Every one of us would say God. I'm sure Moses was thinking, well, Lord, you did. I mean, you made us all. Here's, here's something else that jumped out at me as I was studying. Or who hath made the dumb or the deaf? or the seeing, or the blind. Now, we like to think that God makes everything 100% perfect. But here, God is taking responsibility for things that we would call less than best. I found that to be interesting. And... God, if I, if I can't do something as good as somebody else, that's no excuse for me not to do what I can with what I have. We, we have a tendency to let those with the special talents, those who are good at fill in the blank, do different things. Okay, we, we would love to have people that will preach to us who are very eloquent and good with speech, hold our attention, because boring speakers cause us to fall asleep, or something to that effect, okay? But this is God's word we're talking about. This should never be boring. But with that, I'm, I'm getting off on a rabbit trail there. Okay, so God here takes responsibility for things that we consider less than best. And I think every one of us would consider ourselves less than the best because we look at what we have and we go, I don't see how God can use this. I'm not. And then we look at others and say, well, they would be a better choice. Verse 12. This is the Lord speaking. Now, therefore, go, and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. Again, God promises to be with us. God says, I will be with your mouth to Moses. And I will teach thee what thou shalt say. Teaching requires learning. He didn't say, I'm going to put words in your mouth so that you can speak and not have any trouble. He says, I'm going to teach you. I believe that's teaching him to trust God. Verse 13 this is Moses speaking. O oh my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of whom thou wilt send. In other words, Lord, send somebody else for that job. I can't do this. Get somebody else. 
verse 14, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Now, I don't know what, I don't know if God's audible voice that he used with Moses was like my voice when I get angry because I, I can inflict a certain tone. Frustration. Okay, first of all, I've already given you three signs. Isn't it good enough that I've given you these different signs? Isn't that proof enough that I'm going to be with you? So you're not listening to the first three things or the first couple of things I told you. You keep rebelling and pushing back, and now you're telling me to send somebody else. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. So if the Lord knows that Aaron can speak well, does that mean that Moses couldn't speak well? Sorry, those are things that go in my mind as I'm reading and I'm studying. I'm thinking, hmm, so Aaron was a better speaker than Moses was. But the Lord said, I know that he can speak well. And behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth. And I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth. And I will teach you what ye shall do. Not just say, do. <clears throat> and he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. And he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. So Moses was going to be the mediator there. And thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. And then Moses does go. But as we were, well, as I was studying this, and as Pastor was going through this weeks ago, I saw myself there. I saw myself being Moses. I can't do this. I can't do that. And we've got to concentrate on what we can do, what God has given us. Just like God said, what's in your hand? What has God given to you? We like to say, I don't have great talents or abilities. And, and these are just little notes that I put down here. And, and I, I put down, that is good, because if you had great talents, then you would do things in your power. And you would get all the glory, and God would get no glory. There's nothing impressive about someone who can speak well delivering a great message. That's not impressive. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about just God's word. I'm talking about overall. Okay, there are many motivational speakers. doesn't mean they have God's power. They can speak well. We might say, you know what? I'm the least of my brethren. I mean, of, of my whole family. I'm like the worst choice for this, whatever that task may be. Well, God likes to use those who are nothing in the eyes of the world. Look at David. When God started to use him, what was he? He was a shepherd. He was just obeying his dad, just taking stuff down to the boys. And God was able to use him. He had a sling and some small, smooth stones. What can God do with that? Well, you, saw, you know what God did with it. God got the glory for it, too. You look at Gideon. There's a guy... Now, he had to put out the fleece a couple of times. I think I put the fleece out more than that, but still, he put the fleece out, and the Lord led him, and the Lord allowed him to put out the fleece. God didn't get angry with him, and he took a couple hundred men, a bunch of pitchers, a bunch of torches and trumpets. You, you didn't hear me say sword in there. You didn't hear me say spear. And they're going to go whoop up on these how many thousands of, uh, of enemies? And God used that in an amazing way. In fact, when, when they were getting ready, I don't know how many thousand, I didn't write all this down, how many thousands they had together. And uh, the Lord said, well, Gideon, that's great. You got a good group of guys here, but uh, it's too many. I'm sure he's like, what do you mean? I mean, they got like three bazillion. We have, you know, a couple thousand. 
And, and the Lord was like, nope, too many. Tell the ones who are scared to go home. They went home, and he's like, well, maybe we can do it with this, Lord. Did you hear what I said? Maybe we can do it with this. That's what we, we think. We think we are going to do it. So then the Lord said, no, take them down to the water's edge and have them drink. Guys that drink a certain way, put them off on one side and the other ones on the other side. Well, it was only a couple hundred. The Lord said, those are the ones I'm using. Not because of the way they drank, but because God separated them out. These are the guys. Then they went and got a bunch of pottery and a bunch of torches and a bunch of trumpets. I'm not sure if they had that many trumpets just hanging around. That's a lot of trumpets to take. You know, I think it was 300 men, if I'm correct. Okay? So God used that to get a great victory. And, and we'd be like, how can you use that to do anything? Well, God does it. It's not us. It's God's power. We also like to look at other people and say, well, you know what? God can use that person over there, but not me. It's because we're looking on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. We also look and see what they have that we think we need to have in order to do what God called us to do. We also think, why would God want to use me? Well, God has created you and is preparing you for a specific purpose. I don't know what that purpose is. You may not know what that purpose is. But God's preparing you. And God wants to use every one of us for his glory. Something else we like to say. All I can offer to God is, and I think of a couple of loaves and a few fishes. Look how God used that. There was that little boy that had his lunch with him. He had no idea God was going to do that. He was just doing his everyday thing. Maybe his mom had him take the lunch with him, or maybe he went and picked it up somewhere and was going to take it home to his mom. I have no idea. But the boy had his lunch. And God used it to feed 5,000, and then we had 4,000 in another location. How amazing is that? You can't... You can't say that that boy had anything to do with that other than God used him. That's it. <clears throat> God got all the glory. We need to look at what God has given to us, not at what we don't have. God made us the way that we are for his glory. Remember where I read about God taking credit for the blind and the deaf? That's God's business. We also say it is impossible for me to do what God is asking me to do. And that's correct. You alone cannot do it. You must have God's power to accomplish the tasks. We think it's impossible because we think we have to do it. Can you imagine the, the boy with his lunch? If the Lord said, all right, what do you got there? And he says, five loaves, two fish. All right, go ahead. You start, uh, you break that and divide that and make that into enough for these 5,000 guys. <laughs> but you know what? He handed it over to the Lord, and the Lord took care of that. God will never ask you to do something that he will not empower you to do. If God lays something on your heart, if God is convicting you to be busy doing something, he's going to give you the power and the wherewithal to do it. The thing we've got to be careful about is, is it God that's asking us to do it? There are some times when you can be in a service and it gets pretty intense and people feel like they've been called when sometimes the preacher's the one who called them, if you know what I'm saying. Sometimes our parents like to help us be what they think we should be. 
God does the calling. Let's be willing to use what God has given us no matter how insignificant we think it is. Because God's hand is not shortened. He has no trouble using anything. He created everything out of nothing. How hard could it be? And let's not rebel against God's call. When when we are out and about just living our lives, we are to be joyful. We are to be ambassadors for the Lord. We are to share the gospel with others. And there are some people that just need help. And we need to be that help. I don't know what God puts in your path. I don't know the people that you come in contact with. There's many that you're going to see that I'm never going to touch their lives. But God can use you to speak to them. We need to uplift one another. We need to encourage one another. We need to pray for one another. I mean, there's so many things that God has asked us to do. And, and we've got to have the fruit of the Spirit. And you go down that list, sometimes just driving down the highway, you lose some of that. You know, so, you, I mean, we have to be in God's word. We have to be feasting on his word. We can't be feasting on this world. Is there something that God is asking you to do? Let's get busy serving God. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd be with us, Lord. I pray that we would see this example that you put in the Bible of Moses. And Lord, may we trust you. May we give ourselves completely to you. May we please you with what we do and say, that you get the honor and the glory. We ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's take some prayer requests.